11. I will read in Hindi and Dibashit will read in English. Hear the word of the Lord. Hey Theophilus, I have written in my first book about all the work of the Lord, which has been done from the beginning of the day. और उस दिन तक उपदेश दिया जब तक पवित्र आत्मा के द्वारा अपने चुने हुए प्रेरितों को निर्देश जानने के बाद उसे ऊपर स्वर्ग में उठा न लिया गया अपनी मृत्यु के बाद उसने अपने आप को बहुत से ठोस प्रमाणों के साथ उनके सामने प्रकट किया कि वो जीवित है वो 40 दिनों तक उनके सामने प्रकट होता रहा तथा परमेश्वर के राज के विषय में उन्हें बताता रहा फिर एक बार जब वो उनके साथ भोजन कर रहा था तो उसने उन्हें आज्ञा दी यलुशलम को मत छोड़ना बल्कि जिसके बारे में तुमने मुझसे सुना है परमपिता की उस प्रतिज्ञा को पूरा होने की प्रतीक्षा करना क्योंकि यहुंडा ने तो जल से बदस्मा दिया था किंतु तुम्हें अब थोड़े ही दिनों के बाद पवित्र आत्मा से बदस्मा दिया जाएगा After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in, the few, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, when they met with him, they asked him, Hey, God, do you think that you will be able to establish the kingdom of Israel again? He said, They will be able to know the kingdom of Israel or the kingdom of Israel. They will be able to know the kingdom of Israel. They will be able to know the kingdom of Israel. जब पवित्र आत्मा तुम पर आएगा तुम्हें शक्ति तुम्हें शांति प्राप्त हो जाएगी और यरूशलम ने समूचे यहूदिया और सामर्य में धरती के छोरों तक तुम मेरी साक्षी बनोगे Then they appeared around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. इतना कहने के बाद उनके देखते देखते उसे स्वर्ग में उठा लिया गया और फिर एक बादल ने उसे उनकी आंखों से ओझल कर दिया। जब वो जा रहा था तो वे आकाश में उसके लिए आंखें बिछाए थे। तभी तत्काल श्वेत वस्त्र धारण किए हुए दो पुरुष उनके बराबर आ खड़े हुए और कहा हे गली लोगों तुम वहां खड़े खड़े आकाश में टकटकी क्यों लगाए हो ये यीशु जिसे तुमने तुम्हारे बीच से स्वर्ग में उठा लिया गया जैसे तुमने उसे स्वर्ग में जाके देखा वैसे ही वो वापस लौटेगा before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Okay. All right. Hopefully you guys are back with us. Go ahead and comment on this new live chat if you're with us. I see we got 37 people, so we've got a good amount of people coming back. If you know some of your friends are on the other chat, tell them to move over from the other one uh, onto this new one. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, we were doing well for a few weeks, but we knew we had to have one of these weeks. So we were counting on it, and uh, it's okay. Um, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know where we are. So I'm just going to start over. We're going to start it all over from scratch. Um, I think you guys heard about the Easter prayer guide, so we should be good there. Um, just pray with us. You can download those from the links below. And we're talking about Eastertide. 
Eastertide does this great thing of connecting all of these stories together, right? Lent, Eastertide, Ascension, Pentecost, they're not separate. They're all happening to the same people, all within a few weeks of one another, and it connects those stories together so we can see them as one story. And why that's important then is that you can see the full arc. You can see like the ebbs and the flows of this. Because if you cut it up, you never get a sense of that. You see, oh, Good Friday turns to Easter, great. Or you see the ascension turns into Pentecost, or the death of Stephen causes the spread of the church. You kind of see that all chopped up, but when you put them together, you realize this is one time period of all these crazy things taking place. And I have used my amazing graphic design skills to uh, chart out this, this narrative arc. And so here you can see, when you put it all together, it is like this mountain range of highs and lows. Palm Sunday was this dream of the people of Israel for a king that was dashed on Good Friday. But then from Good Friday, you have the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, him conquering sin and death, an amazing high point, which only a few weeks later turns into the ascension of Jesus, where Jesus ascends into heaven. And I I show that as a low point. Because I think if I had a friend who had to leave again, I would feel pretty sad about it. So it kind of goes down, and then it goes back up into Pentecost as the Spirit fills the disciples and empowers them to have this, um, this, 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 the power of Jesus in them to establish the church. They're spreading the church. They're uh, experiencing miracles, amazing things. But then uh, Stephen is killed. The religious authorities stone Stephen to death, and they're scattered. They're afraid for their lives, and they have to flee different parts of the world. And as a result of that, though, that causes the spread of the early church. And so I think this this helps us to get a better sense of the full story, not just like, oh, Good Friday turns to Easter, or, you know, death of Stephen turns to something else. You can see that it has all these different movements to it. And what that does then is it teaches us a really important lesson, and that is this. That the full story, this Lent, Eastertide, Ascension, Pentecost story, this leap story, disrupts our deeply held belief that our lives follow straight lines going forwards and upwards. I think for many of us, when we imagine a good life, when we imagine a life where everything is going as it should, we kind of imagine progress. We imagine things just going upwards as we go along. And I think one reason why we have that is because that's our culture. Our culture is kind of captured by this phrase called the American dream, which was coined by James Truslow Adams, and this is what he says. Life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. This is the idea that if you work hard, you apply yourself, you've got talents, your life should look better and richer and fuller as you go along. This linear, straight, forward progression to life. And because that's our culture, that gets kind of lived out in so many different parts of our our society. Think about school. When you do the right thing at school, you should go up as you go along. You get your diploma from high school, and then you get your bachelor's from college. You get your master's degree from a graduate program, and then you get your PhD. It goes onwards if you're following that trajectory. Same thing goes with your work life. If you're a good employee and you're doing all the right things, you start off at one level, then you get promoted, and then you become a manager, and then you become a boss, and then you become, uh, uh, I don't know, an owner of something, right? But you're supposed to go up as you go along. You think about relationships, and we have that same idea, the same kind of visual for how relationships should work. You date someone, and then you get married, or you get engaged, and then you get married. And then you have kids. And then your kids have kids. And so it should just all go in a straight line. And so oftentimes that is kind of our understanding, our picture of life and how life should work and how God works in our lives. We apply the same idea to God as well, that a life with God goes straight and it goes up as you go along. Again, there's a lot of reasons why we believe this. It's part of our culture. It's very simple. It's very logical. But what it is not is very biblical because this is not at all what we find in the Bible. We don't find that when God is working and when everything is is going the right way that everything should go straight. 
This leap story shows us this. This is very much a God story. This is God's story. Does it look straight? Does it look like, yes, everything just gets better? No, it's complex. It goes up and down, but it is still God's story. This is not the only example that we find in Scripture. You think about the life of Joseph. Joseph starts off pretty high. He's a favorite son of a patriarch, Jacob, but then he's sold into slavery. He goes from this high point to a very low point, and then he goes up because he becomes the head of a household through his abilities and through what he does. And then he's accused of a crime, and he's sent to prison, an Egyptian prison, for 17 years for something that he did not do. And he languishes there, forgotten, ignored, despite he, had no, uh, he has no responsibility for any of this, until he interprets a dream of the Pharaoh himself and becomes viceroy of Egypt, saving his family and the entire region from starvation. So Joseph's story kind of goes down and then up and then down and then way up. And actually, it doesn't end there. Because if you continue on with the story past Joseph's life, what you will discover is this. He asks his entire family to move to Goshen, to Egypt, to be cared for because of this famine, and they thrive there. But after Joseph's life, the Egyptians begin to resent the success and the prosperity of the Jews, and they enslave them and begin to use them for slave labor. And so the story would actually go down after that. This is a story of God working. It's a story of someone who's doing the right thing. Does it look straight? Does it look like you just go up after a certain time? No, it's all over the place. Another great example of this is the life of John the Baptist. John the Baptist similarly has this kind of upward arc to his life. His birth is heralded by an angel. Now, we might think that in the Bible, everyone's birth got heralded by an angel. It's not true. It actually only happens a few times. You have Jesus, you've got Samson, and you've got John the Baptist. He's one of a few people throughout thousands of years of biblical history whose birth is important enough where an angel actually pronounces it beforehand. From there, he kind of purifies himself in the desert, but then he goes on to be a powerful prophet who's known to be preaching in the spirit of Elijah. Now, for us, we think, oh, I don't know what that means. What that meant was that he was one of the most powerful prophets in all of Israel's history, because that's who Elijah was. Elijah actually didn't die in the Bible. He was taken up into heaven. And so there's this belief that Elijah would return in, in some form, and people believed John the Baptist was this man. He was a powerful prophet. And then the high point of his ministry is when he baptizes Jesus himself. He baptizes the promised one, the, the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus. So he's got this wonderful upward trajectory to his life. But what you'll find immediately after is it goes straight down. He's imprisoned for calling out the immorality of Herod Antipas, the ruler of the Jews at that time period. He's called out for that, and as a result of that, he is actually imprisoned because he, he, he says this is the wrong thing to do. And so his life goes straight down, and in prison he's ignored, completely forgotten, to the point where in desperation he sends out his remaining disciples to Jesus and asks him, did I waste my life? Tell me that you are the one that was promised. And Jesus does affirm that. But his life doesn't get any better. Because right after that, as a result of an erotic dance, and I kid you not, of someone dancing, John the Baptist is beheaded. That's the arc of this man's life. So we might wonder, well, how important is that? Well, when Jesus describes John the Baptist, this is what he says. Of man, of anyone born of woman, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. There's no one greater than this man. No one's life who reflects the power and the presence of God more than John the Baptist. Does his life look like that? Does his life look straightforward and a constant linear progression upward? No. No. It goes up, and then it goes straight down to the very end. What we see then is that this leap story, the Lent, Easter tide, Ascension, Pentecost story, and the life of Joseph, and the life of King David, the history of the people of Israel, the life of John the Baptist, it disrupts our understanding, this deeply held belief that if we do the right thing and if God is working, then our life should just go up and up and up all the way through to the very end. 
It shows us that God can move in very different ways, in ways that are not linear, where we go backwards and we go downwards and we go upwards and we go all over the place. That can still be very much the movement of God. And what I want to point out today is that not only is this a more biblical understanding of the way in which God works, but it is crucial that we revise our picture of the way that God works in our lives and in the world. It's essential that we do this. Not only is it not biblical to see our lives taking this straight line trajectory straight upwards, it's actually destructive. It actually damages our life when we have this perspective on what our lives should look like. The first reason why it's so dangerous to see life in this linear, straightforward, straight upward view is that a linear understanding of God's ways allows us to falsely condemn God. You see, if we believe that a good life where God is working should go straight up, and our life doesn't look like that, and our life goes down and up and around and whatever the case might be, what we will discover is that we will feel like God is not holding up his end of the bargain. Because our life should look straight, but it's looking like this. And so one party that we could hold responsible is God. And sometimes we do that, and sometimes maybe some of you have done that, where our lives start to look like this, and then we turn to God and we say, God, why aren't you being faithful? Why does my life look like this? Because it's supposed to look like that. And in the end, what we're doing is we are trying to hold God responsible, accountable for a promise that he never made. He never told us that a good life looks like this. He never illustrates that in his word. But we try to tell him and condemn him and judge him for how we believe our lives should go, for our misperception. And sometimes that's the basis of why we condemn God, is because God is not holding up a promise that he never made. That's a dangerous thing. And that's one of the most dangerous things that happen when we see a straightforward, linear understanding of how God might work. We can blame God incorrectly. The other thing that we can do, that a linear understanding of God's ways allows us to falsely condemn ourselves. So on the one hand, when our lives starts to go all over the place, but we believe it should be straight, we can turn to God, and then we say to God, God, why did you mess up? But the other person that we can blame is ourselves that we can take a look at our lives and see that it looks nothing like we imagine ideal life to look like, and we could say, what did I do wrong? Should I have moved to this city? Should I have married that person? Am I not smart enough? Am I not attractive enough? What did I do wrong? Because if I had done the right thing, then my life should look like that. And you see how this linear understanding begins to make it possible for us to condemn ourselves. For us to look at our own lives and say, I must have done something wrong because my life does not look like this picture. When this picture is not what a life should look like. It serves as a basis by which we condemn ourselves. And I would venture a guess that many of us do that right now. That you are judging and condemning yourself for not living according to this ideal trajectory when that's not a life that we can live. And it's not what God promises for any of us. The third incredibly important reason why we need to change the way that we see that God works, the picture of God's ways, is that a linear understanding of God's ways allows us to falsely condemn others. In our lives, when we see our lives looking all over the place, we might blame God. We might blame ourselves. But what if we see that in the life of someone else? What if we look at someone else's life and their life starts to look like this? If we believe that an ideal life and a good life should look straight and we look at someone else's life, what we begin to naturally think is this, you must have done something wrong. Because if you had made the right choices and you had the right values and you worked hard, it should look like that. But it doesn't. Your life looks like this and it's going down. And it's all over the place. And therefore, you must have done something wrong. This linear understanding of how God works and how the world works and what our lives should look like actually make it possible and encourage us to point our fingers at one another 
It gives us the rational basis to say, you must have done something wrong because I can see it. It's not just a perspective on ourselves or of God. It allows us to judge people. And I would take it one step further because this is not just the reason why we judge individual people in our lives. I think we do the exact same thing to entire groups of people. We look at the story of groups of people at a time and we see that they don't look straight, but they should look straight. They should look straight if you do the right thing, if you work hard. But this group of people's lives look like this, and they're in this position. Therefore, they must have done something wrong. Their people must be lazy. They must not have the right values, because if that people had the right values, then their lives would have looked like this. We have to understand this linear understanding of life and the way that God works undergirds racism itself, classism, prejudice. It's not just this this American dream that we have. It is something that allows us to judge everyone at once. It allows us to set one people group apart from another. As an Asian American, I'm part of a group of people called the model minority, and our lives look like this oftentimes. And so people will say, hey, your life looks like this. This other minority group looks like this. You've done the right thing. They've done the wrong thing. We use this as a wedge between people. And you see how incredibly dangerous this is. This is not a small perspective shift. This is something that undergirds judgment of God, bad theology. It causes shame and self-condemnation. But it also undergirds judgment and condemnation, racism, classism, prejudice in our midst right now. And that's why it is so dangerous. Jesus, though, has a radically different way of looking at this. In John chapter 9, we have this interesting but often overlooked story of the disciples seeing a man who was born blind. They see a man who from the very beginning was born blind, and they ask a theological question, which probably would have been common of that time period. They look to Jesus and they say this, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, this understanding of life wasn't just American, it is human. Human beings, even of that time period, would look at someone's life that went all over the place and they would say, someone must have messed up. Someone must have messed up for his life to look like that, for his life to be looking straight down and all over the place. Someone messed up. Jesus, who was it? Did he mess up? Did he do something? Or was it his parents or his grandparents? Because someone must be responsible if this man's life looks like this. This is not just an American concept. Even a first century Jew would have said the exact same thing. But Jesus' response, we really have to sit with this because he says this instead. He says, neither, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. He looks at this man, this man's life who is all over the place, going up and down and straight down into the gutter, and he doesn't see failure. He doesn't see one person messing up or this person messing up or God being messed up or whatever the case might be. He looks at this and he says, you know what that is? It's an opportunity for God to work. You know what this life is when it goes straight down? It's just a chance for the glory of God to be revealed. He doesn't see blame. He doesn't see judgment. He sees a moment for God to be God. That's all that he sees when he sees a life that looks like this. What we need to learn is to revise our understanding of when we see our lives or other people's lives looking like this what we need to understand is that the ups and downs of our lives don't point to the failure of God, ourselves, or others. They are merely opportunities for God to demonstrate his faithful presence and transformative power in our lives. This up and down that we see, we interpret it as, I messed up, God messed up, or someone messed up. But God looks at the ups and downs and he says, this is my chance to show my power. It is my opportunity to show how faithful I am, that there is no up and there is no down where I cannot be a part of. That is what God sees when he sees the up and down. 
And that is what we need to see as well. That when we look in the up and downs of our lives, instead of saying, someone screwed up here, to think instead, how is God going to show up? And when someone else's life or a people's lives look up and down, instead of looking on in judgment, which is what the world has done and will always do, we see an opportunity for God to do something better, for restoration and redemption. We just see opportunities. I can just hear Sean Good echoing in my mind as I talk about seeing people as opportunities. That is a 180 program kind of tagline. But this is what we find in Scripture, that we would see these trajectories and we would see opportunities for God to be at work. I pray that it would be so. That we would look at lives that don't look straight and we would no longer see failure and, and wrongness and, and bad values and all these different things. But instead, we would simply see an opportunity for God to be God. Why don't we pray And then we're going to um, take the offering and also sing a song of worship. But let's, let's ask God to do this. God, we do want to confess that so often we have a very wrong-headed understanding of what life and what you look like. That because of our culture, we think that it's straight and up and things just get better. But we want to proclaim and remember that's not what we find in Scripture. You move through chaos You move in ways that we can't see. You move in mysterious ways, in the ups and the downs of our lives. And God, we pray that you would revise that and reform that in each one of us. Take out, take away this simple and this wrong-headed understanding of life. Help us to dismantle it and replace it with this understanding that there is no life where you cannot work. That up and down lives are simply an opportunity that the works of your Father might be displayed. Do that, Holy Spirit, that we might see the world and ourselves and one another in the way that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.